So next up in our unit seven discussion is gonna focus on emotion. And that is, this is a topic that can really confuse students. So uh, let's first define what emotion actually is. So emotion, uh, most people get the terms emotion, feel, feelings, and mood confused. They use them interchangeably, but they're actually uh, technically different as far as uh, what they characterize or represent. So emotion, well, actually let's put them all up here. It's definitely related to these, for, to feeling and to mood, um, but they are definitely separate as far as technically what they actually are. Emotion is, by definition, a um, something happens externally, or you could recall it perhaps, but uh, it's basically a response to a um, an external stimulus. And when I say response, I generally mean a physiological response. For the most part. So something happens, or you think about something perhaps, uh, and then what occurs, and that's the emotion by the way, it's that automatic physiological uh, response to uh, whatever the stimuli is. So that's the emotion itself. Uh, and then what happens is you have a surge physiologically of different neurochemicals, um, most of them uh, are going to be related to arousal, so it's going to be norepinephrine and epinephrine related. Generally, um, you experience this autonomic increase. Uh, your sympathetic nervous system heightens your um, uh, heart rate, etc. Uh, you're more alert, and uh, that's what most emotions uh, tend to orient towards, but not all. Um, and then uh, that's when you are going to experience the feeling, right? That's what we get here. That's the actual physiological response. Uh, the physiological response. To the uh, emotion. Now, this is where it gets confusing, and we're talking about some of the, the uh, theories. But the feeling more so refers to your actual experience, like uh, how it actually feels in you when you're experiencing the emotion. Because again, the emotion is the thing that's triggered by the um, either your perception uh, or uh, some sort of stimulus, whether it's external or you, or you thought of something. So this is the uh, trigger. And this is the surge that you experience. And uh, what a mood is, it's basically just a prolonged uh, feeling. Uh, many days or weeks, etc. So if you've been feeling irritated all day or, or happy all day or angry all day, that's, that's your mood. You've been feeling that way for a long time. Um, and the emotion is generally a, a, a response to something. Uh, and there's many, many responses it can be to. But emotions are sort of, so we've kind of discussed this, these emotions are quite important because historically, we'll get, we'll get more to this on the end, um, these serve as, the, as like a, um, a very quick mechanism for assessing a situation to your brain, uh, particularly when it comes to things that are threatening. Um, what that means is we don't always have a chance to uh, as we're going through life, take everything as it comes and then assess what everything is and what it means and whether it's dangerous or not, or whether it's uh, good for us or not, uh, whether it's um, uh, going to harm us in the future or, or, or now. So we get these instant responses to them, like we get, we get triggered by some sort of stimulus, uh, we experience a feeling, and then that usually is going to impact our behavior. Um, uh, and that, that's really what emotions are. And then of course, um, in experiencing this, this feeling, um, we express it. Uh, that's also part of the emotion. So usually uh, there's some typical expressions for uh, anger or happiness, etc. Both facially, which we'll get to, and then also what you can actually carry out in the world uh, verbally or, or physically. But emotions are kind of like these really quick instant processing uh, mechanisms for us. So we don't have to think about um, particular uh, instances. So for example, Fear is a good one, which we'll talk a lot more about uh, in a bit. That's part of a defense mechanism you have automatically uh, programmed into you. Um, so most, almost all creatures, or almost all humans anyway, have this inherent fear of snakes. That doesn't mean you have like a phobia where you're like fearing them constantly. If there's one, you know, across the room, you feel like it's going to be, you know, all over the place, whatever it might be. Uh, but almost any person who's standing there, if they look down and in the peripheral vision, they see the shape of a snake or a snake next to them, they're instinctively going to jump away. Uh, and that's kind of what this emotion does, is it 
automatically scans as we're you know taking in information, even unconsciously we're not aware of, uh, right? The, some of the conscious parts, what I'm focusing on, and the unconscious parts just coming in um, uh, through my my dual processing um, uh, mechanisms. So it's constantly being taken in, uh, and I don't have time always to uh, assess all the information and, and whether it's a threat or not. So these emotions kind of uh, are inherited circuits that are pre-programmed to uh, give us a feeling uh, that uh, guide our behavior. That's why emotions can be experienced, like fear, for example, in animals that aren't even conscious uh, of uh, their own existence and, and what feelings are and how to describe them, uh, like we humans can subjectively feel and, and express. So emotions are kind of uh, uh, instant, uh, what's the word I'm looking for when you're assessment, instant assessment circuits that allow um, quick appraisals to uh, guide action. That's important to note here, by the way, uh, is emotions have um, an excellent function at least historically, because again, that, that snake thing, for example, or something that's unknown, uh, you'll get that fear sensation. And those ancestors that didn't have those circuits pre-programmed that automatically feel that fear and avoidance of a snake or a spider or, or uh, of, of being uh, in a high up area uh, or the darkness or going into a scenario that's uh, unpredictable or, or unfamiliar, you'll get that fear automatically. Um, and that's, uh, that's, that's kept our species alive across time. The, the, the animals that didn't have those circuits automatically ingrained that when they experience something that is uh, unknown or unpredictable or threatening, that they feel fear and then they avoid it or they run or they fight it or they scare off, whatever it might be, um, they died, right? Because the, the ones that didn't jump back from a snake who would potentially bite them uh, very quickly, um, if they had to think about what it was or they didn't have a reaction to it, they get bit and then they, they may run off afterwards, but then they die of the venom and they get eaten. Uh, whereas the ones that have this instant uh, appraisal and, and reaction to it, um, they avoid the bite or whatever it might be or knock the spider off of them or they, or they don't go up high on that cliff or that tree or whatever it might be. Uh, they keep living and they pass on their genes. So gradually across time, those uh, creatures that did not have these uh, emotional circuits and mechanisms already placed in there, uh, they were much less likely to survive. Having said that though, almost any time you can think about uh, actions, um, and, and as far as their future relevance, emotions are generally a very bad way to assess the situation. So if you're trying to make a decision, in most cases as a human being, um, emotions are not a reliable mechanism for, for guiding your behavior. Uh, they are preloaded um, old circuits that, first of all, we can attach to different things. We'll talk about it later, how your perception can affect uh, how you emotionally uh, react to certain phenomena. But um, just because you get an uneasy feeling or a good feeling or whatever, um, it could be totally unrelated to what you're actually uh, planning. And it, and it definitely doesn't mean that something will or won't work. Um, so if you're thinking about especially things that are long-term, uh, like relationships or work or even what you're doing in the day, uh, it's generally not a good idea to use emotion as a guide for your decision making. Uh, it's generally a good idea to try to think about what will actually uh, happen as a result of your decisions and, and what the consequences of that are, because they're generally unrelated to your actual uh, emotions and feelings in that regard. But they can be quite useful, especially in a pre-civilized, pre-society world uh, when there were threats all over the place and um, uh, you know, uh, good feelings meant generally things that helped survive and bad feelings generally meant things that were unfamiliar or dangerous. Um, nowadays, it's a bit more complex since we're in a much safer situation. It's generally a better idea to actually think about your actions. You can't think about every word that comes out of your mouth, but certainly things that you do have are able to exercise discretion with. Uh, it's generally a good idea to not listen to uh, or have your emotions alone uh, guide you. Uh, but the other thing about emotions is they can also affect how you perceive things. Um, so that can make it additionally complicated. So for example, if you're in a, if you just happen to be sad or down, that's really going to affect how you think certain events will transpire. So you're less likely to do things that might be positive for you because you assume they won't work or they'll go wrong. Uh, or if you're optimistic, you're on the happy side, that'll make you more likely to do things that because you, you think things will work out or maybe they won't. Um, but yes, so that's why emotions um, are generally not a good guide for decision-making. Um, 
but uh, it can be fun to enjoy them uh, depending on the situation. So that's what emotions are. Uh, there have been lots of explanations for emotions, and we'll go through several of them uh, slowly. But one of the first uh, theories for emotions and how they work came from uh, William James and uh, his partner, Carl Lange, I think. Uh, this is known as James Lange theory. If it's German, it's Lange, I don't know. But we're just say Lange because we're, I'm in the United States. Uh, so James Lange says, William James and Carl Lange, or Lange. Um, they proposed that emotions were dependent on our physiological responses. Um, so it's kind of the, the scenario I, I laid out for you as far as how feelings work. You have this stimulus, whatever it is, uh, you get a physiological response and you get a feeling and then you perceive that feeling as sadness or, or anger or happiness or whatever it might be. So uh, you have the, the theory for them is that first of all, so emotional theory, emotion theory, uh, first, you have um, external stimulus, or it could be internal if you think of it, I guess, but stimulus. And that, of course, uh, is taken in and processed by your brain, and then uh, your brain responds to that. You get a physiological response. So in this case, it's actually your nervous system that sends a signal, releases various neurotransmitters, uh, and you're uh, going to perceive that feeling, and that's going to... Um, affect how you, no, that's going to cause you to perceive the emotion and experience the emotion. So, uh, number three, uh, your um, perception or awareness of the physiological response uh, is the emotional experience. So that's the, uh, the causal line of thinking or theory that James Lane proposed. And the primary factor here is the physiological response. Um, they think that that's a, a key element, that if you don't have that physiological response, you don't have any feeling and you have no emotion to perceive. Uh, that's what they, they feel. So you can't feel sad if you, you can't be sad, experience sadness if you don't feel sad. Uh, you can't experience anger if you don't feel angry. Um, so that physiological response, that arousal, and then your perception of that is what uh, causes you to experience that emotion. So without the physiological response, uh, they believed that there was no way to experience emotion. However, um, there's another theory that came out later. So this was actually in the 19th century. This is way back in the 1800s. Um, a few decades later, the Cannon Bar theory was developed and goodness, I forgot their names. Was it Philip and... Uh, Philip, Walter, there it was, Walter Cannon and uh, Philip Bard. I think this is the 1930s, and, or 40s and 50s? I know the 40s are involved there. It might be 40s and 50s. I think it's 40s and 50s, regardless. Uh, they're actually going to go a step further. Um, they look at this, and this is the 30s and 40s. So there's no cognitive revolution. I can't use an MRI or something like that to assess if I'm right or wrong. So what they do is they take animals, uh, I think it was cats, and what they do is they uh, take this out of the equation. Um, so they remove the physiological response as far as being able to perceive it. So they take these cats uh, and they find the, um, they find the autonomic, uh, the, I think it's called the afferent autonomic nerves that come into their brain. Afferent means they bring in signals, like they're coming into the brain. They severed those uh, from the perception part of the brain. So you're not actually, aware of the physiological effects. So like if you, if your autonomic service, uh, 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 if your autonomic functions uh, increase, your sympathetic nervous system's activated, you're not aware of it, essentially. You're not getting information about it. Uh, but they found that people, that these cats could still experience and express the emotion, even though they have no awareness to their physiological response. So they don't actually feel it, but they still have an emotional reaction. Uh, despite not being aware of this physiological response. So uh, they actually proposed a different theory uh, that um, said this may be involved, but it is independent of or separate from uh, emotion itself. They actually uh, characterized emotion as being derived from uh, subcortical regions, which means not your cortex where you're perceiving, where you can think about things and appraise them, uh, 
that's your more limbic system where um, you're, it affects your behavior and physiology, but you're not really consciously aware of it. Um, when you feel things, our, our cortical reasons are the ones that recognize the patterns and label them and say, this is fear, this is whatever. Um, so they are saying, asserting that um, we don't even actually need that conscious awareness because if they detach it and you're not even aware of these physiological effects, animals, these cats would still experience the emotions. So um, uh, how do you say this? Physiology and, um, uh, no, let me restart this. They actually attributed emotion, emotion, linked to subcortical regions. Because again, when they severed the physiological uh, connection to their cortical, or, which is again where you, where you can actually consciously think about things and realize what they are, um, they would still express and feel these emotions, or, um, or express and uh, experience the emotions. So uh, they believed that the causal factor in emotions and how we express and experience them actually comes from uh, the hypothalamic structures, so parts of the hypothalamus, and the uh, thalamus, I think it was the dorsal thalamus, dorsal medial, we'll just say thalamus, I forget which part of it it was, dorsal medial, dorsal, I'll look it up later and I'll, I'll put it in the link if I was wrong, if it wasn't the dorsal uh, part of the thalamus, but they believe that it was the uh, uh, subcortical regions of the uh, thalamus that actually caused someone to experience and express emotions and that it, it acted totally independently of this physiological response. Um, so that was a, that was a big step um, in, uh, how can I phrase this? Big step in not opposing, but discrediting at least uh, the pure physiological dependence of the James Lane's theory. So again, they believe you experience this arousal and then your perception of that arousal is what, what causes the experience the emotion. Uh, Cannon Bard, though, says, no, even if you remove this, even if we sever those nerves from these cats, for example, and they're not even aware of these physiological uh, effects, they can still actually experience and express the emotion. So they believe the uh, thalamus played an integral role of that. Uh, then came along uh, the Schachter Singer theory. This is also known as the two-factor theory of emotion. So the same thing, um, Schachter. Stanley Schachter and Jerome Singer, I think is what it was. Stanley Schachter and Jerome Singer. Uh, this was a, a bit later. And I don't remember exactly which decade. I want to say the 60s. I can't remember exactly what decade they did their research. Nonetheless, it was around, it was around this time. Uh, regardless, they had the two-factor theory. So that was the actual theory that um, the physiological response is likely linked to some degree. Uh, but it's not just by itself. There's actually a second factor that... Um, is linked to or, or explains how we experience emotions. So they actually believe the two factors were, of course, a physiological uh, response. So you're, you gotta interpret that to a degree. Uh, but also, you have to cognitively appraise it. Cognitive appraisal of experience. So while these guys actually offered some um, subcortical explanations for emotion. They propose that, uh, yes, the physiological is involved, but you actually have to cognitively appraise it. So that would be a cortical region function. Uh, and we've, we, by the way, found out that the, it's a combination of both, uh, more, most likely. <clears throat> but nonetheless, so the way they tested this was, so again, Lange said, just physiological response is, is, uh, is uh, the explanation for why we experience and how we experience emotions, how we perceive those. Uh, Cannon Bard theory uh, stated that we don't need the physiological, we can actually uh, experience and um, express emotions purely with our uh, hypothalamic and uh, thalamus structures in the subcortical regions of our brain, because they did that with cats by, again, severing the physiological afferent uh, autonomic system from their um, uh, uh, perception in the, in the uh, brain. And the uh, Schachter Singer theory goes kind of a step further in pointing out that 
Since we obviously do um, are aware of our physiological responses, they likely do play a role, uh, but we also have to cognitively appraise. So when I say cognitively appraise, meaning we have to identify what the thing is that uh, um, is associated with this physiological response. So what I mean by that is, this is you perceiving the feeling, like describing it as happy or sad or whatever. Uh, this is you perhaps experiencing it uh, or at least expressing it. This is saying, I get the feeling, but then I have to label it what it actually is. Uh, and they are largely correct in that because that's what humans do. Because we know that animals get this uh, and this, but they don't sit there and talk about it and, and, and express it and know it and anticipate it. Uh, they just react when it, when it comes. Humans, though, can think about it. So when we experience some sort of physiological arousal, uh, there's a, you know, an emotional stimulus, emotion goes, get the feeling surge, uh, the physiological surge. We have to actually search our environment and label the thing uh, to identify what caused it and then identify what our emotion actually is. Because a lot of emotions actually feel very similar. Uh, so we usually look for some sort of environmental explanation to label what it is. So here's how they did it. They basically took four groups. I might do this partly incorrectly. They took four groups and they used epinephrine, which of course is a, is a physiolog physiological um, causes a physiological response. It's kind of like a stimulant. It causes you to be more aroused in that uh, you're more alert and your heart rate increases, etc. So they gave three groups this, norepinephrine, this epinephrine uh, injection. The fourth group was a, was a control group of placebo. They got, they got an injection, but they didn't tell them what it was, and it was, it was nothing. Um, so they, got, they injected all the groups, uh, and then one of the groups they told was epinephrine and to what exult, results to expect. One group they didn't tell what it was, and then the other group that got the epinephrine, they told them uh, false uh, side effects of epinephrine. And like I said, the fourth group, they, didn't, they gave them something, they didn't tell them what it was, but it was nothing. And then they have this uh, a confederate, so they give them, the, and they'd all experience the uh, arousal, right? They'd, they have, they'd be twitching, they'd be alert, they would know something happened in them physiologically, but they didn't know what. Uh, and being able, for them being able to explain what emotion they were experiencing uh, was dependent on adding a confederate to the experiment. So somebody would come in and say how they felt. Um, so other people uh, would only consistently align their, or explain their uh, emotional response, their physiological response, when they had an environmental uh, uh, gauge to, to look at and determine what it actually was. So they couldn't just feel something and, and tell you what it was. They had to like look and ga gather clues from the environment uh, to see what it actually was or have somebody else define it for them. Uh, and they found that, that, that it correlated with the Confederate that people more consistently labeled it when they had some other environmental factor to, uh, with which to label it or identify with. Uh, so that's the two factor thing. Um, you uh, require, requires environmental uh, cause or link to uh, identify and experience an emotion. Uh, and that's, that's sort of how that progression works. Now, it's, we're going to talk a bit more here in a second about uh, adding another layer of appraisal. But just to, to recap, James Lange, you get the physiological response, and then the, your perception of that is the emotional state. Cannon Bard says, no, no, no. If we take out the physiological response, cats, anyway, could still actually express and experience the emotion, even though they had no awareness of this physiological stimulation because that pathway had been severed from their brain. Uh, and then uh, the two-factor theory from uh, Schachter Singer uh, are gonna point out that uh, it's actually both. You need the cognitive element, as a human anyway, for us to label it, uh, we have to have a, a cognitive uh, uh, element to it of recognizing what it is and then giving it that label. Because even if you give people the physiological response, they don't know what it was unless they have some environmental thing to attached to it and then they think about, oh, it's, it's this, it's anger, oh, it's happiness, oh, it's fear, whatever it is, as long as they can explain why it's there. Uh, so these are all elements uh, that have added, added portions of our understanding uh, of emotion. But it doesn't end there, in case you weren't confused enough. Uh, in 1991, they're going to extend it uh, one more uh, step, I guess you could say. Uh, and this is going off of uh, Schachter's um, uh, Singer's theory about but there being two factors, and they're going to focus on the cognitive appraisal, right, where your 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 perception of uh, your environment and what is going on or what could go on actually 
causes you to experience emotions differently. So this is referred to as appraisal theory. And this one was, um, oh, what was his first name? Richard? I think it's Richard, and it's Lazarus. Richard might be wrong, but Lazarus is the uh, last name. I'm gonna spell this wrong. Uh, Lazarus. And this is in the 90s, 1990s. This is more recent. Um, he actually found that uh, your emotional experience is dependent on your perception of the event. Uh, so it doesn't matter what your physiological response is. What actually really matters is your perception of the event. Uh, that's going to dictate uh, your emotions. So uh, that's what it means, by the way. Uh, your cognitive appraisal uh, is what uh, causes or affects uh, the emotion. It determines it, essentially. So we're, we're moving on from just feeling it to uh, now we're specifically talking about recognizing and labeling these subjective experiences we have. Uh, and, you, and you know this too, by the way, because I could give a different stimulus to different people and they're going to react to it differently. They're going to have different emotional reactions depending on their experience or appraisal of the scenario. So like if you, you, know, if you show somebody uh, a picture of um, something that's, I don't know, like a, like a war scene in Afghanistan or Iraq and then there's like a, uh, it's, it's a really bad mangled body or something. People are going to react differently to that. Some people are going to be disgusted. Some people are going to be saddened. Some people are going to be fearful. Some people might be interested because maybe they like the military or I don't know. Uh, they might be borderline, borderline like sociopath, psychopath, whatever it might be. Um, or just have a demented sense of humor. They're going to uh, definitely react differently to that and have a, dish, a different emotional response. And that, of course, they're going to get these physiological responses, but it has to do, it's dependent on their cognitive appraisal of the stimulus itself. So here's a more simple example, because that wasn't probably too helpful. Um, if, let's say, uh, you've got a first date coming up, we don't know what your emotions are going to be regarding the actual date, um, the lead up to it and during uh, the actual date. It's really dependent on your own perception of the actual date. Now you can definitely argue that personality has an, uh, uh, Personality weighs in on this, like your propensity to, for extroversion, positive emotion, uh, or neuroticism, negative emotions, gonna really affect your own self, you could say self-esteem, I suppose, but your own confidence uh, and your own outlook or attitude. But your first date, you could uh, think, you know, not just one of two possibilities, but here's two examples. You can have a positive outlook on the actual first date, like, oh, this is potentially the person I'm gonna marry and have a family with. Whoa, what a wonderful opportunity. Right? Uh, future spouse, we'll just say. That's a, that's a positive outlook. And if you actually go in with that attitude, uh, and, that, and that, uh, that's your cognitive appraisal, that's your perception, that's going to cause you to feel uh, happy, perhaps, uh, energetic, giddy, etc. We'll put giddy. Giddy, joyful, whatever it might be. Uh, however, if you have a more pessimistic outlook, like, oh, um, this guy or girl is going to try to weigh me down. I'm not going to be able to pursue my career if this works out or they're going to, I can't trust them. They're going to, they're going to screw me over. You're going to have a negative outlook, right? Negative. Uh, what should be, uh, you, you know, you can't trust them. What would you say? Uh, ruin ambitions. There we go. You're worried that they will ruin your ambitions for your career or whatever it might be. Um, and then that will cause you to feel uh, perhaps angry or resentful or sad or uh, uh, lonely perhaps or uh, like I said perhaps angry, however your response is. Um, your perception of that event is actually going to determine your emotional state uh, and how you, res how you respond to that. So it's definitely like all things with psychology, it's a complex interplay of things. You can never just label things. So we definitely have some uh, causal links to uh, multiple factors, whether it's the cognitive appraisal of the event affecting my emotional experience, or it's the physiological effect, which also has an impact at least, uh, or it's my uh, hypothalamic and, and, and thalamic uh, structures that uh, are, are largely linked to the emotional uh, response and uh, uh, experience of that emotion. Okay, so there's some um, wonderful uh, theories regarding uh, emotion. We're going to move on now, lastly, to a, a, a more complex discussion of what's considered kind of, well, it's got the culture in too, but evolutionary psychology. So psychology that's linked to um, how our ancestors have acquired traits over time that have helped them live. 
so that the uh, organisms that don't have these, we're talking about emotions, emotional uh, circuits uh, died off because their survival was, uh, chances were reduced. Uh, and the ones that have them, and we have them now, uh, were better able to live with these emotional circuits, uh, and so they've passed them on evolutionarily. So uh, this is a much more closer look, but I exclusively uh, look at evolutionary uh, psychology and their explanations for emotion and emotion. Uh, and, and one of the guys we're going to talk about clearly points to both, uh, both a cultural element for emotions and uh, a, a biological evolutionary element. Uh, first guy, though, um, Joseph Ledoux. Joseph Ledoux. Uh, he is still alive, actually. Uh, I think he's in the 1960s to now. I don't think he's still researching. I think he's in his 80s. But um, he has, he's still, he's still alive, technically and um, technically. Uh, he's still alive, and I'm not sure how much he's contributing to the psychological community, but uh, uh, he's still around. So, Joseph Ledoux, uh, he did some really uh, important research. I think he was uh, linked with Michael Gazzaniga in his PhD studies, and he would um, he had interesting theories about the amygdala, because that's where a lot of our fear comes from, um, or what we perceive as fear. Uh, so he did a lot of um, research on what he calls, or later calls anyway, defense circuits uh, for assessing threats. Um, and the one that he focused on the most, at least initially, was the amygdala, uh, which is a subcortical region. Uh, and of course, that's going to link the cortical regions, which are cognitive appraisal, right, which is what appraisal theory is all about. But it links it also with our, our subcortical. And he actually directly links it with both uh, conclusively, he shows there are two, at least two pathways to this amygdala that what that initiates our fear response, uh, that that feeling of being frightened and that that physiological arousal and uh, that affects, of course, our perception. Um, there are two routes. Uh, so to that amygdala uh, and the set of circuits within it, uh, the two routes. Uh, one is uh, the low road route, low road, a subcortical uh, route. Uh, that is quick, nearly instant, quick, uh, intense, uh, subcortical pathway to uh, fear response, which is like, okay, that makes sense. That's what most people were thinking it was uh, anyway. But there's also a clear high road, or at least they had historically, uh, and then of course this is adding more of a conscious element to it. The high road, which is, uh, uh, I mean, it doesn't mean it's slow because it's still occurring neurochemically, but uh, it's a slower, I guess you could say, uh, but more information intense pathway uh, linked specifically with uh, the cortical regions in your prefrontal cortex. This is gonna be key too. So your amygdala pathway, at least in humans, it's got two paths. The instant path that, that comes primordially, uh, as well as, and then we share with many other animals, and then our unique, or at least somewhat unique, I'm sure great apes and orcas and stuff have something similar to this, but at least for us humans, we have a high road connection as well, which is how we're able to perceive these things. Uh, because animals are all gonna get the same response if you put a snake in front. In fact, if you do this with your cat, if you put like a cucumber behind them, they'll turn around and they'll jump up out of fear. We have that too. Uh, but you wouldn't say that cats or dogs experience fear because they can't recognize what it is and label it. Uh, they just experience the arousal and then they you know, instantly run or jump or whatever it might be. Um, we experience fear because we can anticipate it. Um, we can uh, describe what it is. We can recognize the patterns. Um, but it's important because this uh, is what is often linked to, uh, to human anxiety disorders. Uh, an anxiety disorder is, a, is, a, is an unreasonable, irrational fear of something. So like we all have this instinct to uh, fear snakes and avoid them. Uh, at least we're not expecting them. Uh, but when people are, are you know, not willing to go out of their house because they fear there being a snake or a bee or a spider, whatever it might be, then you're, then you're reaching anxiety disorder levels of a phobia, uh, uh, whatever it might be. So because we cognitively appraise these things as threats and we fear anticipating uh, interacting with them and uh, over, over uh, assess the actual threat, they are to us, that can result in these crippling anxiety disorders that, that spiral people uh, you know, into more and more um, uh, maladaptive behaviors. 
uh, in their actual life. So he found though that this prefrontal cortex um, route to your amygdala, which is associated with fear and, and anxiety, um, you can actually uh, manipulate that to reduce uh, these anxieties and fears over time. Uh, so it can function kind of as a mechanism to extinct or, or inhibit these uh, fear responses or this anxiety linked to a particular fear. Uh, and again, you do have various predispositions genetically as to how active those pathways are and, and all of that, but uh, it does exist. And that's what enables people to actually get over fears uh, or anxiety disorders with exposure therapy. Um, so he uh, showed, um, in fact, when, when, when Pavlov would, would, you know, when you use operant, or sorry, uh, classical conditioning to train dogs and other animals, things to, to fear uh, sounds and whatnot because of a punishment, um, they weren't, the, the brain wasn't creating fear. They were basing off of their experience, their association with a negative stimulus. So they're, they're trying to keep themselves alive or avoid pain, whatever it might be. Um, so the brain doesn't like create fear or contain it. We're actually just, uh, we're just consciously appraising this, this, uh, this experience because we are, at least as humans anyway, conscious of what the, the patterns are in our brain that, that fear look like. Uh, and then we associate that with life-threatening because that's what historically it was there to do, uh, save us from life-threatening um, uh, instances or experiences. Um, and so he found that with this link, we can actually realize that no, our, our subjective human experiences uh, and our perception of whatever the fear might be uh, doesn't necessarily mean that it's uh, actually the circuit itself uh, functioning as a defense mechanism for us, but it's really just our fears that have been spiraled out of control. Uh, and that has allowed, so showed uh, prefrontal cortex, uh, or sorry, fear uh, was a subjective human experience. Uh, and that, of course, that meant that we could uh, uh, manipulate this or, or, cap or exploit the prefrontal cortex connection uh, to enhance uh, or guide uh, exposure therapy, which if you don't know what that is, because that's actually unit uh, eight, clinical psychology. Exposure therapy is when somebody has a, an intense fear of something, like let's say elevators. I've used this before um, as an example. The worst thing you can do is have them avoid elevators. They'll just become increasingly afraid of it. Uh, what you actually need to do is expose them uh, to increasingly acceptable uh, but but um, uh, more involved levels of exposure uh, to elevators. Might start off as just just thinking about an elevator and then seeing one at a distance and then getting this much closer next time, and this much closer next time, and then eventually touching it, eventually pressing the button, and then the next time they put a foot in, you know, progressively going and getting over the sphere and realizing it's not as uh, damaging. Because again, they're consciously reacting to their defense mechanism as, is, as if they're going to die, even though, you know, using an elevator while there could go something, something could go wrong, overwhelmingly the odds are that there's nothing that's gonna go wrong. Even if it does break down, it doesn't mean you're gonna die or be hurt in it. Um, so that uh, enables you, us to use this high route to uh, uh, um, sort of get a hold of our anxieties and not let them uh, be dictated by this, this defensive um, uh, survival <clears throat> uh, mechanism. So this is very much in line with evolutionary psychology in that we have got these mechanisms that were biologically handed down to us and they have enabled our survival and then uh, our fear uh, is a result of our uh, human cognition and our ability to recognize these patterns. And then, uh, of course, uh, we initially would um, associate them with life-threatening uh, ordeals or situations, but they might not necessarily be so. Uh, so that allows us to, of course, use our prefrontal cortex and exposure therapy and, and other forms of therapy and conditioning uh, to uh, reduce our anxiety and fear. And that's why those things can work. And the last one that we're talking about, so that's a, that's a very um, biological evolutionary explanation. Um, while we're still on the topic, uh, a guy named Paul Ekman, who's also still around, Ekman, very popular, I think he's one of the most cited uh, psychologists, uh, period. Um, he also was very interested in biological explanations uh, for emotional uh, expression and behavior. So he went out seeking um, universal human uh, emotional expressions, like so, like, are emotions just uh, culturally manufactured? Um, do they exist in all humanity? Uh, and if they do, how do they exist? So he went through and he analyzed the faces and emotional reactions of many, 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 many cultures across many years. Uh, he identified, um, so he's seeking universal human emotion 
expression. Uh, and he found quite a few. So there are 10,000 different expressions human beings are capable of. 3,000 of them are linked to emotion. Uh, and there are some, uh, some cross-cultural expressions that are recognizable. So it doesn't matter if you use somebody from a Western or European culture or image or face or, or uh, an Asian or an a North African, Southern African, it doesn't matter. You can take these pictures of various expressions and uh, people can pretty universally identify, um, even people that have not had contact with civilization can identify what these emotions are. Um, so like six of the most common ones, um, the universal ones where people can universally recognize happiness or joy, I should say joy actually, Joy, um, uh, disgust is uh, universally recognized for the most part. Uh, wrath, or, or I guess you could say anger. Um, what else was loneliness? Um, what else was loneliness? Not jealousy. I'm trying to remember what the other ones were. I don't even know if sadness was one. Um, oh, shock. There we go. Shock was one, I forget the other one. There's another one too, but uh, these were the most common ones that were easily recognizable. So we absolutely did find a biological link to emotional expression uh, in humans and body language too, uh, and some verbally too, as far as how they speak. Uh, he found a bunch of them. In fact, he was known as the human lie detector uh, because he knew based on your body language, facial expression and word use, uh, how likely it was that you were lying. He found that's really rare too for people to have that ability. I think he tested like 10,000 people to see if they had that ability, only 50 of them did. It's, it's pretty rare. Uh, nonetheless, so that's the biological element, but there is a cultural element that's linked to these emotions because uh, the context, in, in some cases, of when these things appear uh, changes based on culture. So culture impacts uh, the context um, uh, or uh, stimuli but the responses are gonna be the same. So for example, um, it might not be acceptable in uh, certain cultures for you to display individual emotion very often. So even though you might feel angry or sad or lonely, um, it's not socially acceptable to display that. So people will mask it. Uh, but when people do display the emotion, it is a universally um, uh, uh, accepted or universally interpreted uh, and common expression. So again, the situations where you experience the emotion, or, or express it, I should say, uh, not experience, but express it, that varies from culture to culture, because they can have limitations. Usually they're limits too, by the way. Um, so non-Western uh, civilizations, for the most part, uh, have more uh, limit cultural limitations on emotional expression. Uh, so that will cause them to, you know, withhold their sadness or loneliness or anger uh, and not express it. Uh, but when they are expressed, they're very similar. They're universal as far as how humans express them. They also might change the things that you are disgusted to or angry about as well. Like, um, for example, uh, in the West, you'd be disgusted by the consumption of uh, dogs or cats or insects. Uh, but other parts of the world, you get disgust not for those, but for other animals. Like uh, in India, you, you get disgust uh, response for, um, for cows, um, depending on the region you're in. Uh, or, you know, in some cultures that, that view uh, pigs as an unclean, um, animal, if you ate pork or bacon in front of them, even though to you it's just fine, um, to them it would be disgusting. So the triggers themselves can vary based on culture, and then the context of when it's okay to display them uh, can vary, so that's cultural. Uh, but the actual expressions themselves are universal. Also, too, they found, I don't know if it was Ekman or not, but they found that some of these are so universal that uh, even, the, even the natively blind express these the same. Natively blind smile, for example, when they're happy, uh, and others at the universals. So even though they, they have no way to uh, visually learn what these look like, these expressions, uh, they, when they are expressing their emotions, express them similarly uh, to people that uh, have been able to uh, uh, visually um, process what they look like. Um, another set of cultural differences besides the context of when it's appropriate to express emotion uh, or the triggers for that emotion uh, could be, um, what was the other thing? Oh, symbols. So the expressions are universal, but um, cultural symbols can vary. This does not do much with emotion, but like for example, if you're trying to tell somebody they did a good job or you're happy, you give them a thumbs up, that's pretty universal-ish. But depending on the culture, that could be uh, an insult. So for example, in the West, if somebody says, how are you or how'd you do? And you're like, okay, or did good, you might give this symbol. But that symbol actually, um, 
uh, in Brazil, for example, is uh, an insult. It might be like giving somebody a middle finger uh, instead of saying, no, I'm okay, or it's, it's great. Um, so those can vary, uh, but that's not really necessarily an emotion. Uh, it is a form of expression, I suppose, but just know this. The expression of emotions uh, are generally, generally universal as far as facial expression, body language, and um, uh, la oral uh, communication. But the culture does impact when it's appropriate to express them, so that causes them to hold it back. And it might actually cause these emotions to be activated uh, by different stimuli. So again, something that's disgusting to one culture uh, doesn't get a disgust response of another and vice versa. Something that would make, make somebody angry in one culture wouldn't make them angry in another. Like for example here, um, here if, uh, no, we won't go there. We'll just end it like that one. I'm not gonna get all cross culture about what would make people angry or not. Let's just stick with the disgust one because that one's an easy one. So that is uh, essentially a section on emotion. Uh, next we'll talk about uh, stress and coping and, and how that's linked to, of course, to these evolutionary mechanisms for, uh, for, for threat assessment uh, in these defensive circuits. Um, and then we'll talk about the impact that has on your body. And then we'll finish with um, personality, the different types.